Today, I have the honor of introducing you to Dr. Julia Varshavsky, who's Assistant Professor in Health Sciences and Civil and Environmental Engineering at Northeastern University in the US. And we will speak today about her research on our environmental chemical exposures across our life, which impact human health. Welcome, Julia. So lovely to have you on here. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. So, Julia, we'll launch straight into it. First question for you today is, could you give our audience a brief snapshot of your research career and how might someone go about getting into this area? Sure. Um, so I uh, research environmental health and environmental health health in a nutshell is basically how the environment impacts human health versus the other way around. And of course, the environment can mean a lot of different things, right? Because we're exposed to a lot of different chemical and non-chemical stressors throughout our daily lives. That's true from the air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat, products we use, and the social context in which we live. Um, my focus has been mainly on chemical exposures. And that's really because since World War II, synthetic chemical production has increased dramatically uh, worldwide. And as a result of that, as the US National Cancer Institute recently put it, our babies are now being born effectively pre-polluted with many synthetic chemicals in their bodies at birth. And we care about that because a lot of these chemicals are biologically active compounds that at low doses can interfere with the molecular signaling that really governs human reproduction, development, and function. So uh, environmental health also is a very interdisciplinary field. I, um, I, um, and so getting into this field uh, for me was the combination of a lot of different interests. I was really interested in becoming a doctor and I was on the pre-med track, very much interested in developmental biology and molecular biology. And then I became more interested in social justice and environmental impacts um, in college and found this field as a way to blend all of those interests uh, and and uh, yeah I'll stop there. That's perfect Julia I am sure well you've just blown me away already I have so many questions for you I'm sure our audience does too but um, okay there's so much there uh, so maybe you could tell us first about your your own research in on these environmental chemicals um, and your own research around maternal and child health at Northeastern University um, and also I suppose the Protect and these ECHO projects, these world famous projects that you're involved in. Yeah, absolutely. So my research um, covers quite a bit of ground. I look at exposure sources and how those relate to chemical levels in the body and then how those levels in the body relate to biological effects um, like placental disruption and endocrine disruption, and then how those effects uh, relate to actual clinical and, and subclinical uh, maternal and child health outcomes, including things like pregnancy outcomes, um, cognitive and behavioral effects, effects on growth and metabolism and so forth. And that's, uh, we care about that in both the fetus, the developing child, as well as the pregnant individual after pregnancy. Um, some examples of how that, what that work looks like is um, uh, we've done a study showing that um, people in the U.S., including children, teenagers, and adults who dine out, have higher, significantly higher phthalate levels in their bodies compared to people who eat mostly at home. So that's an example of how we look for uh, possible um, exposure sources that we can intervene on to reduce exposure. And then we also look at how chemical levels in the body impact health, right? So um, at Northeastern, I'm collaborating with uh, researchers here to look at these pregnancy and birth cohorts, including the Puerto Rico Protect study, as well as ECHO, which basically is a combination of multiple longitudinal pregnancy and birth cohorts across the United States. And we're looking at chemical mixtures, essentially, and how they relate to maternal health complications and child development. So examples of that include, we have a paper currently under review at EHP that is um, that's showing that uh, uh, or I'm uh, sorry, paraben and phenol mixtures are associated with increased risk of hypertension during pregnancy, which is um, a really important pregnancy complication. And we're also seeing that uh, PFOS mixtures are associated with um, 
changes to uh, early markers of infant neurodevelopment that have been associated with uh, reduced cognition and development later. So those are some examples of how we're looking at that in our in our cohorts. Uh, it's it's incredible, and and there's already questions and comments flying in for you. But I I just I suppose <laughs> to kind of finish up our interaction, you know, how can you're talking about eating out? <laughs> If you're scaring me, you know, how can we limit our exposure, you know, and also regulatory agencies, you know, they yeah. need to, you know this, this yeah. needs to be managed, you know. Well, as well yeah. as managed. The short answer is we need a combination of individual and sort of societal level, policy level action. Um, one of the ways we tell people that you can limit your exposure to chemicals in foods um, that would include phthalates and pesticides and other compounds is to try to um, buy fresh and less packaged ingredients, less processed foods. So those have the nice benefit of also being health, more healthy for you anyway, um, organic when possible, and to limit our exposure to harmful chemicals in personal care and consumer products, some of the things we can do on an individual level or try to use fragrance-free products. But of course, these uh, these options aren't easy for everybody and uh, not necessarily a fair burden to place on individuals. And the problem with persistent chemicals like PFAS is even more complex because they don't break down easily in the environment and therefore they've contaminated a lot of drinking water uh, systems worldwide. So the issue is, is not really addressable just at the individual level. We really do need a push for uh, removing these compounds at the source and turning off the tap to PFAS, so to speak, so that it's not polluting our drinking water uh, for many years to come. So we those kinds of um, actions would look more like a, a chemicals policy that regulates, um, regulates uh, the emissions of chemicals. It would look like pushing for green chemistry, safer solutions, safer alternatives as well. So much. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I suppose... First, I want to ask you around the differences in in the US, maybe in Europe, in terms of um, how chemicals go to market, because that's really interesting to me. Yeah, so in, in the, 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 the biggest difference, I would say, historically between TSCA, which is the US chemicals policy, um, and REACH, which is the European uh, version of that, is that um, in the US, the burden of proof has really been placed on the EPA to prove chemicals are harmful after they've already been released onto the market. The burden is not placed on industry to demonstrate they are not toxic before uh, letting chemicals into commerce. Uh, whereas in, uh, in Europe, it's a little bit different and there is more burden placed on industry uh, before pre-market. Okay, so so these chemical are these chemicals that you're talking about, the phenols, the phthalates, the PFAS, they're byproducts really of the plastics injury industry, but oil and gas, okay, that seems to be you mentioned World War II. Maybe you talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so it's it's really hard to talk about chemicals, synthetic chemicals, without talking about plastic and oil and gas, because um yeah, there's a paper actually that recently came out in the New England Journal of Medicine by Tracy Woodruff that covers some of this, but fossil fuel production and plastic production has increased more than 15 times since the 1950s, and fossil fuels are really an, a very uh, important source of many, chemi many plastic chemicals. Um, and so you can't really talk about plastics and, and chemicals from plastics without talking about oil and gas production. Okay, so there's a lot of questions coming in, and um, one of our um, one of our guests today, Susan Gray, is asking around links between pollution levels of babies and neurodiversity or anxiety and depression in later life. Absolutely, yeah. So we uh, we have a lot of evidence, um, increasingly showing that there are some links between uh, prenatal exposure to many different compounds and. Uh, neurodevelopmental issues, including anxiety and depression in children. Um, that that a lot of 
th there are some equivocal findings depending on which outcomes you look at and which chemicals, but overall, there's a lot more, there's a lot of literature uh, on this topic and we're learning a lot as we speak. This is a very hot topic in the field right now. Because you're also looking, Julia, in these in these massive projects, these protect and echo, you're actually looking at the cardio, you're down at the biochemical level when it's looking at what's happening in the body. So maybe you could actually talk a little bit about this, about what you found. Yeah, so we have a recent study um, showing that PFAS um, mixtures, so PFAS are these per and polyfluoral alkyl substances um, that are used for their stain and water resistant properties, they're used in a lot of different products, uh, including consumer and industrial products, and we have um, uh, data showing that they are associated with changes to non-nutritive suck. This is a an early marker of uh, central nervous system integrity that's been pioneered here at Northeastern by um, my colleague, Dr. Emily Zimmerman, and uh, changes to NNS have been, um, certain changes to NNS that we're seeing in relation to PFAS mixtures have also been associated with decreased cognitive and behavioral um, measures at uh, seven months of age and 12 months of age. So that is one um, uh, way that we're seeing the effects of, of one class of chemicals, PFAS, on uh, neurodevelopment, but there are also other examples as well. That's incredible how the baby's actually sucking from whatever their bottle or, um, you know, actually has a map, uh, a relationship to what's happening in their brains. That's, that's incredible. And, and, and it's so other questions, this work exclusively on potential human damage, or is it linked in any way to the wider environmental situation? I think it is, but but in, in your uh, echo. Yeah, yeah so maybe speak a little. Oh yeah, absolutely. I was gonna say that reminds me of just thinking about how the environment out there or what we think of in environmental health as the environment in our bodies in a way, but it's really all connected, right? So things that are harmful for wildlife and harmful for the environment tend to be also harmful for us as living organisms. That's not always true, you know, exactly, um, because we do have slightly different biologies, but a lot of these chemicals operate at the molecular level um, on uh, molecular signaling that is conserved across species. Okay, so complete change talk here. Uh, so there's questions coming in around socioeconomic factors and cohorts that you've looked at in your studies and I suppose environmental exposures. So maybe you could talk a little bit about, about that, about disparities. Yeah, that's a really important point is that we're not all created equal in the way that we respond to chemical exposures. A lot of different factors influence our susceptibility and our risk. And those include uh, biological factors like how old we are. Are we developing? Are our bodies developing? And there's a lot of signaling going on, hormone signaling, for example, uh, which makes children, uh, babies, fetuses, babies, children, um, anyone sort of go undergoing some sort of developmental process more susceptible. But then there are also socioeconomic factors for sure. Social stressors, if we are burdened by additional either uh, chemical exposures or are, are if we're burdened by additional social stressors like poverty and racism, we are more at risk of both exposure and uh, disease. So there's a real equity issue here uh, uh, on top of everything else and um, particularly in terms of demographics and ethnicities. Okay, so, right. So we're talking about drinking water, food, cosmetics, even the air. I mean, there was a study earlier on um, in like about a month ago that got released coming up from Italy that showed, so I know you work on the chemicals, but actually, you know, showed the actual bits of plastic were inside our arteries in our atherosclerotic plaque in people and people and that they had a tendency to burst more and therefore people got more strokes, more heart attacks. I mean, is this waking us up that we're seeing actually the physical pieces and these chemicals, these invisible chemicals like that we don't really think of and we're washing our hair with them, we're drinking them. What, what, what's, the, what's the field response to that? Yeah, I mean, microplastics is, is um, a very hot topic right now. And I think a lot of it does have to do with the fact that it really resonates with people, these physical pieces of plastic getting uh, caught in our bodies and clogging our arteries or uh, doing other things. And so, yes, we've been looking at how different uh, chemicals I've been 
uh, mentioned can impact cardiovascular disease or contribute to cardiovascular disease by uh, through, through different molecular pathways or, or uh, physiological pathways like oxidative stress and inflammation. But now we're seeing that the actual physical particles themselves are also increasing our risk of, of these things. So the combination of the physical and chemical um, risk is, is really going to be really important to understand more as we go forward. And okay, so I, I kind of asked you the question already, but I'm going to close on this because we were completely out of time. But, you know, how can we <laughs> reduce our risk, I suppose, um, as consumers, but also, you know, is it wh whose responsibility is it? Is it the regulatory agents, our governments? How do we as a whole, as an as a as a world reduce our environmental exposure? Big question, but you big got question. It. And I'll give you <laughs> kind of a big answer, which is that we need we need changes at many different levels. So we need uh, individuals and consumers to understand how they can best protect themselves with the tools and resources we have, but we also need to push for better policies that reduce the source of these uh, uh, pollutants um, directly. And we need to, in the same way, be pushing for industry innovation and green chemistry, safer alternatives. Possibilities are out there that we don't uh, necessarily have the incentives to um, to push industry to kind of move towards, and we can do a better job at all all of those levels. I think. Wow, Julia, that was just incredible, and we are unfortunately completely out of time. So, sincere apologies to those of you in the audience whose questions I didn't get to, but I just wanted to take this opportunity to say a massive thank you to Julia. Most fascinating discussion today. So, thank you so much, Julia. Thank you. Amazing. And thank you to everyone else for joining in. We're already getting the most amazing comments. Thanks, Sue. Super interesting and so thought-provoking. But please do check out our website for our list of upcoming speakers. And I'll see you all soon on the next HIT series. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.